Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Marcela Celorio. I'm the Consul General of Mexico in San Diego. And uh, I was asked uh, to participate here today uh, to have a, a good conversation with these uh, three main actors in the uh, issue of culture and uh, how to build community and awareness. And uh, so maybe, uh, James, uh, we can start with you if you can uh, tell us. Um, you know, you're an architect, right? Yes. And uh, maybe you can tell us uh, how come you became an architect and uh, if that decision now, with all the, the, these things you're, you're doing in uh, Logan Heights, um, is helping this, um, you know, this background. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to everyone for attending. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a, actually a failed furniture maker. I, <laughs> I, I went to architecture school, but when I got out, the economy wasn't so good. So I tried to make a living doing art and furniture for several, several years. And um, currently, I, I, I kind of work in a, a, a loose triangle of, of occupations, in a way. One is um, my, I'm an architect with my firm called Public Architecture in Logan Heights. In a, another corner of the triangle, I operate uh, with several other people. Bread and Salt, a community art center in Logan Heights also, in the same building. <laughs> Makes it convenient that way. And we're, we're new. We've, we've been around for five and a half years now. Okay. It was an old Weber bakery. And at the other corner of the triangle, and I think I'm floating in, in around, I'm kind of like a fly hitting the walls of the triangle. <laughs> at the other, the third corner, um, it started out as, a, a, I think, a small study that I did. I was a I spent a year in 2008, 2009 at Harvard on a Loeb Fellowship, and I, okay. I went there with the intention to uh, study the idea of making a border city, a city on the border between San Diego and Tijuana. And, but the, at the end of the year, I ended up uh, studying the possibility of a, a true binational park on that site at the site of Friendship Park. Okay. And uh, when I got back from the one-year fellowship, I had found that the Border Patrol had built the second fence, which had cut off access to the inner fence, a very, very important meeting space. So I spend my time these days kind of cycling back through somewhere in between all of those important elements. And let me ask you something. Where are you originally from? I'm from, I was born in Newfoundland, Canada. My dad okay. was uh, in. Uh, oh, wait, there's, an, there's not another Newfoundlander in this room, I'm sure. But my dad was in the U.S. Navy. Okay. Uh, and uh, we, so I never lived in a place for more than 18 months until I entered uh, high school, so. Likewise. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I hope to stay even more here. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I'm used, uh, used to moving around, but I ended up in San Diego, and uh, it slowly became a, a real home. And it's kind of odd when you're someone that always moves around all, you, yes. you don't have a place to like uh, center yourself. It takes a lot of years to do that. Yes. Yeah, because, well, my question was that because I wanted to know how come you got involved with the uh, border dynamics. Why think about uh, binational or cross-border city and, you know, that it's, stuff? Uh, it's the most important topic of the region to be a practitioner in San Diego. If you just work north of the borderline, then you're missing a very important kind of tool or, or ingredient to your practice. And also, there's the idea that it's something that must be confronted you know, by all of us. Our best, they talk about, it seems like to be a narrative uh, in the United States that security, security is very important, so perhaps we need this wall. But our most important security, in fact, is our friendship. Uh, with the common, uh, the, with the citizens of Mexico uh, alongside the citizens of the United States. That's true security. Well, I'm glad that you. <laughs> well, I'm happy that you acknowledge this <laughs> because not everybody, you know. Um, now I would like to, to ask uh, Jesse. Um, I read your, your bio, but I think that there are uh, something that is missing, like uh, all the hazards that you have been facing, like being a homeless. How come, if you can tell us about um, it? One of the, one of the issues that, that I grew up with is actually, um, we were very unstable, my family. 
Um, I grew up in a in a very chaotic home. Um, it was a a lot of abuse in, in in my in my family, and we we were where I'm actually from Los Angeles, California. Um, my my mom's from Guadalajara, and my dad's from El Salvador. Um, you know, it, it's it was it was pretty hard. It was pretty hard growing up with with uh, with a family that's just kind of broken down. You know. And um, the fear of, of having that abuse in the house is, is very, it was very tough. So um, it was a point where we, we couldn't really function together. So we had to break apart and everybody went their own way. I have um, brothers like down in Los Angeles that, um, you know, had to just kind of detach from our family. And um, me and my mom, we actually ended up coming to San Diego. You know, my mom had to get away from from everything that was going on with with my dad, and um, uh, we she, she we came over here. She she believed that there was something else, you know, something different. She's just kind of trying to figure out how to get us away from all of that, you know. And um, knowing that that well, not knowing, you know, that there wasn't really too much of of a opportunity, I guess, you know. We, when we came here, we saw that the rent was so much higher, and you know, we we figured, oh my gosh, like you know, what are we doing here? But we didn't have any money, you know. Spending spending our cash is pretty much like trying to find a little place, a little room, somewhere to go to, like just trying to to have some kind of roof over our heads, you know. And um, we ended up figuring out, hey, you know, let's go to Mexico, like let's let's try to figure out how to how to live a, a life that's that's going to be a little cheaper you know we figured that a lot of the people that we knew were like down over there saying hey, the rent is like two hundred dollars for like this you know and we said okay you know let's go down there and um we ended up staying over there and actually for a while we ended up just staying with our family <laughs> you know just um just trying to figure out how to not struggle so much you know and one of the main struggles is actually crossing the border. And I can really relate to one of the students here, you know, saying that uh, crossing the border every day, we, it's, it's, we have to wait about maybe three to four hours in line. And me coming from Rosarito, which was a little further than, than Tijuana, I would have to wake up early. We didn't have a car, you know, we didn't have anything. We had to go on foot. So um, we would have to wait for the taxi in the morning. And like, cause um, there's certain like, I guess, uh, neighborhoods. You have mm -hmm. to get out and then go to the main roads. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a struggle, 3.47 in the morning every day, you wow. know. And um, having to go from there to downtown Little, Little Italy to go to school and uh, having the front desk woman tell you, Jesse, you need to wake up a little earlier, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and yeah. me standing in line like four hours and just like, Falling asleep, practically standing, you know, it was it was really hard. And um, but l like knowing that it was worth fighting for that education, you know, that um, that the opportunities are, are are extremely different, and we have to realize that, you know. And um, but was there like a breaking point? How old were you when you were in Rosarito? When I was in Rosarito, uh, well, it was back and forth. So okay. if we couldn't find a place here, we had to go back, wow. you know, because. Um, other than that, we were in shelters, so we were in like rescue missions, St. Vincent's. Like, um, it was just so many, so many different situations. We were just never in one place, you know. And yeah. and it's really, it was really unstable. Um, when when it was my my own breaking breaking point. Um, so my my mother had this relationship with um, uh, my stepdad, and it was very hard to deal with that. He was an alcoholic. And um, there was also abuse there. You know, it was more of a verbal, and like he would uh, he would leave, and after he would leave, um, I was the only one there with her. So everything would kind of fall on me. So it would be more of like a blame game. You know, like it would be my fault, and her yeah. own her own um, issues started coming onto me. You know, so after a little bit of of <laughs> that, like it was just my breaking point in saying, you know what, like. I can't, I can't take the abuse, you know, I can't take it anymore. And, and I ended up being a runaway, a runaway teen at 16. Um, I ended up going to a shelter called Storefront. 
and from there you know I said like I'm just gonna I'm gonna make it you know I'm gonna try to make it out of here you know I'm gonna try to make that change and not only for me like there are so many youth out there that are going through the same thing that I currently know you know and um, I've gone to different programs and I'm currently like still visiting these programs and it's it's a really hard situation to see that um, these these age groups you know we kind of just took them away you know these these situations where um, we see homeless people and and we've gotten so used to it that we kind of just oh you know like turn the other way let's just walk across the other street because the street is full why is it full why why are these people out there you know and and if we realize how many of them are youth you know how many of them could be in in such higher positions and have so much opportunity and the opportunities out there the thing is outreach is very is very complicated you know and um, so for me one of the things that that um, that I like doing is with art you know like communicating with people so um, I, I'm actually working on an um, on organization that's going to be launching in, in October and um, I will be using you know graphic design and um, t-shirts and art to just pretty much spread out this information and spread out awareness, you know, that there, there are youth that have this potential, you know, that, that, um, that there's just so much power, you know, but we, we have to be heard, you know, there, there has to be a way for us to be able to reach it, you know, so. Great, well, now I'm, we are gonna talk with David Favela for a while. Uh, when I saw the branding, I was asking you, but it was a uh, Border X Brewing in Barrio Logan or Border Cross, right? <laughs> and you said it's that is, is both. <laughs> Can you tell us about that? Sure. So uh, when we thought about the branding, uh, we were located originally right at the border in Otay Mesa. So we're like, well, we're the southernmost brewery in all San, you know, San Diego, all California, maybe in the U.S. And we said the border is something important to us and defines us. And so we started playing around with words like frontera and this, that. But, you know, we finally settled on Border X. And it means so much to us from a variety of perspectives. Um, we are children. Of, I am a child of the border. Uh, my nephews grew up in who are the brewers were in Playas de Tijuana, mm -hmm. yet they graduated from SDSU as well. So this border has just been a central element to our entire life. Um, and so when we thought about who we were going to be as brewers, we thought, well, we're not Irish. We're not German. We're not you know, Polish or Czech or any of those you know, uh, cultural traditions where brewing is a, a strong tradition. We're, we're Mexicans. And yet you know, we know how to brew. So how do we put those two things together? And that fusion is why we called it border X, X really standing for anything that you want it to stand for, whether it's crossing borders and flavor, okay. and mixing up a, a traditional European brewing tradition with Latino or Mexican flavors, or whether it's artwork, or whether it's our decor, our marketing, everything about us is about that fusion. And um, so that's why we decided <laughs> to do it that way. And I was just reflecting on some of the personal stories from the earlier panel, and it suddenly dawned on me that it's so consistent in my life that the border has been a central element. So we came from Durango, the northern state, Sierra Madre, a little village there, ranchers. And uh, my father first came to Tijuana and lived there and had brothers and, that grew up there. And, but I was born in the US, so there's this really interesting spread of our family from Mexicano as Mexicano comes <laughs> mm -hmm. to my youngest sister, I'm the second youngest, who, does, who, who struggles with, with Spanish, right? Yes, that's, that's what I read about him, yeah. And so just within my own family, there's this huge spectrum of assimilation that has happened. And, and so it's kind of ironic that at this stage of my life, one of the most important businesses I've launched is actually about the border. So from, from the beginning to the present, it's been a continuous element in my life. Well, yes, in your bio I read that you had this uh, fight with the bilingual education. Yes. And that was the problem. Yeah. And uh, I remember that when I arrived here in San Diego a year ago, remember that we talk about uh, being bilingual, and uh, I had a challenge with my, with my kid. Even we, we were posted in Washington, D.C., and my kid was uh, six years old, and they told me that I had to choose between or either Spanish or English, but he cannot do both. So what will be your message? Because you have been, you know, 
on your own skin, you have had that experience. So what would be the message uh, pro bilingual education and the importance to, and the, that we are able to do that? Yeah. I don't know if everyone read the, read the bio, but I had a terrible experience, not uncommon to a lot of children that are born in California to immigrant parents. They didn't know what to do with us. I was before bilingual education, so I showed up at school and I was one of the few Latinos. Mm -hmm. And they would apply the traditional IQ tests. You know, I remember the, the square pegs and the round holes and all, you know, all kinds of different tests, and they determined I was learning disabled. And instead of going to the school two blocks away from my home where I could walk easily, I was sent across town to a special education school by bus. And uh, yeah, it was an awful experience. And I was blessed, though, because even in you know, great tragedy, there's, there's always hope. Um, I hid in the library and taught myself to read. And it was very funny, because the first book I remember pulling down, uh, I saw a picture of a gentleman flying through the air with little wings on his ankles. And I said, what the heck is that? And uh, you know, Greek mythology is actually a classical education where most private schools start is in Greek mythology. And that just is what really got me reading. And eventually, by the fourth grade, they figured out that I wasn't learning disabled. I was actually a bookworm <laughs> at that point. <laughs> but my advice is real simple. And it's the same advice my father gave me is, you know, Miko, you know, you learn English, but keep your Spanish. It's going to be a huge asset to you in the future. And it has. It's defined me. And, you know, I work at HP now. I was actually an expatriate in Guadalajara in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley of Mexico. I helped start up uh, a whole manufacturing operation down there back in uh, early, gosh, what was it, um, 2010. And now Guadalajara is also a booming tech hub. Yes. And um, so having that ability to just shift, you know, language, vocabulary, culture, all those elements, and still be effective in any situation, how could that not be a gift? Of course. Yeah, I see it that way, too. And James, um, I want to, to ask you something. I'm, I'm coming from New York. And you know, New York has a different uh, dynamic. And Los Angeles, even, has a different dynamic. Uh, I think that it's a challenge here in San Diego. What you're doing with this uh, place that you're building, uh, Bread and Salt, and these, I uh, read also about these pedestrian uh, walkways, mm. and, mm. Uh, and I found, find that fantastic. But I think that there's a challenge to, to build community and to, how do you encourage this community to get involved in arts and participate, uh, like in a big city? So can you tell us about that? You're, you're talking about the, the perceived difference between the, the level and quality of the arts in San Diego and, and other large cities of the world. <laughs> I, I think it is. Uh, I'm a diplomat. That's why I, I put it that way. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say it's too and blonde. I, and I used, to, I used to believe that. And, and when I first heard about this, uh, I was a young architect. Mm -hmm. And all the young architects were saying, there's nothing happening here. You know, nothing's going on here. We got to get out of here. We got to go to LA. We'll work here for a couple of years. You know, get our licenses, go to LA, go to New York, go to a big city, and become famous. Mm -hmm. But uh, I found that it's really a state of mind. You can do exactly what you want to do right in your own city, and and try. If you, it only takes four, three, four, five people to make a movement in any city, and you see that in, in art history, in architectural history. All the movements are created by a teeny group of people that their influence has spread. And the same thing can happen and will happen in San Diego. It is happening in the arts, I, I believe. Um, a lot of artists still have that knee-jerk reaction where they're not making it, but they might make it somewhere else. But I'm seeing an arts community now, and it's not only San Diego, but it's our region, the artists from Tijuana and San Diego combined, that are making a huge difference in the, on the world stage. And, uh, I, I think we are going to do it in our own city. Okay, and I'm going to ask you something else. Um, if San Diego uh, wasn't here along the border, close to the border, and was, you know, in the Midwest somewhere else, do you think it will be the same? Or the border has something that, you know, uh, impacts this uh, city? Oh, definitely. There's, there's no doubt the, the strength of uh, two cities next to each other, two very different cities. I think one 
can potentially strength, strengthen the other to a great degree. And it was interesting in the panel before us, it, was, it seemed like it was difficult for the entrepreneurs, at least in Tijuana uh, or in Mexico, to break through uh, a certain wall, a barrier. I think in art and architecture, it's different. I think the power of the arts kind of re reverberates back and forth between the cities and is making a stronger impact. And you're seeing, you're, we are seeing that uh, in, in other writings, like the New York Times was writing about architecture and art in, in, t in the Tijuana area yeah. all the time. And food, yeah. food, be, food being one of the arts. And the LA Times, the same thing. It's, uh, it's, it is explo it's absolutely exploding the influence of Tijuana on San Diego and the whole world. Uh, and at, at, you know, at Bread and Salt, uh, it's a, I operate, a, it used to be a Weber bakery, a 45,000 square foot building, quite a large building. And um, we bought it six years ago. We, the, the corporation, Weber, sold it. And we were actually not the highest bidder. We were the lowest bidder. Oh. But the other entries into the project, they said that they, they wanted to, because we were asked to write a narrative, what we were going to do. They were typical developers. They wanted to tear down the building mm -hmm. and do housing projects. And I said, I, I want to use every aspect of the existing building, uh, build additional square footage. Uh, but turn it into a uh, community arts building. And, they, and it's interesting that Weber had already a history of, of community outreach. They were there since the first corner of Weber's was built in 1896. Wow. Um, on, and that, that corner is still there at Bread and Salt. And so for many decades, they've had a community room on the second floor that they've allowed uh, people in the community to have birthday parties, weddings, mm -hmm. dances. And so we get. We get people in their 80s and 90s like come up the stair, and they say, you know, there used to be a place that I went to a wonderful. high school high school dance. I said, I know what you're talking about. It's right there. And I take them in there, and they kind of like look around, like sort of stunned. And you can see they're sort of remembering. Wow. So there's this really long history at uh, Bread and Salt of community outreach, and so we're 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 continuing that legacy. And uh, some of the things we, we sort of have a, a rule of thumb that uh, any of any uh, anyone in our neighborhood within a couple few blocks radius, they could have any event, any event they want for any no matter how small the group, whether it's a meeting or a family birthday party or something, and they can we just allow it to happen. So this is this is was this has been our introduction into the community and for the six years and it. It's, it's helped, you know, because we are outsiders. There's no doubt about it. Yes. And we have to introduce ourselves in, a, I think, an open, positive way. And that's what we try and do. Fantastic. Well, now, uh, talking about the border, and we cannot uh, be remiss in saying about, uh, Jesse, if you can tell us, you, you lived in Mexico, and you experienced Mexico. And nowadays, there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Mexico is facing insecurity, violence, uh, but nevertheless, you made it. Uh, a lesson I learned when I was posted in the Middle East is that, yes, there are a lot of problems, you know, that uh, we face as uh, countries, as a population, but uh, you keep on walking and you keep on doing things. So can you tell us about that experience? Because you were in this, uh, complicated, to say the least, ambience, but you, you succeed. You're 21st, 21 years old, and you're pretty mature. And how can you tell us about that? Well, one of the things is um, there, there was uh, a lot of violence. And I had actually a lot of the students from my school tell me, you know, how do you, how you cross the border every day? Like, don't you see these things going on? Aren't you afraid? And um, I mean, no. <laughs> you know, um, I I did see a lot of things, and and there was a lot of things happening. But one of the things that that I would say, you know, like I I love, I feel like my heart comes from Mexico. You know, like everything that I've been through over there, everything that all of the people that I knew, all the youth that I that I that I come to to just grow so closely to, um, it made it worth it. You know. 
And uh, one of my goals was to actually create a program in Mexico for that, for the youth, you know. Uh, I love art and I feel like that was my, my escape, you know, my, my way of actually rising up to the top, you know, for, for, for me that, that was my, my staircase up, you know, and uh, I, I noticed that there was no after school programs, there was no, you know, there was nothing that, that got students to focus on anything else but to be in the streets, you know, but to be um, in gangs, but to be in, in trafficking, you know, narcotraficantes, and, and uh, it, there was a lot of that activity in, in that neighborhood, you know, so um, I decided, wow, like there's so many things that, that, there's so many opportunities here, like why not share that, you know, so um, anytime I was able to, to get a canvas, anytime I was able to get paint, anytime I was able to do anything like that, I would actually um, make presentations, you know, in high school, and I still have the files of the presentations and um, collect these things and take it to, to, to the youth over there, you know. So um, just being able to, to have that, that just picture of seeing, like, the youth touch a canvas for the first time and say, oh my gosh, you know, like, like, oh, que bonito. Like, it's just <laughs> something that, that I felt was worth it, you know, and, and it made me not, not have that fear, you know, yeah. because me coming from that background of, of poverty, you know, like there was moments where we didn't have food here or over there, you know, so um, being able to, to see that I'm making a difference in somebody else's life, that makes a difference in mine. So, um, just, you know, I, I, I didn't fear it at all. But what would you say now, nowadays we're facing this uh, new, uh, well, the end of uh, DACA, the mm -hmm. executive order, and uh, now Congress have six months to, to legislate about it, and there are a lot of uh, dreamers mm -hmm. uh, that are identifying more being Americans than Mexicans, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of fear among the community how come I'm going to go back to Mexico? And you were lucky because you had the experience to live there, but some of them haven't. Uh, they were very little small when they came here. So um, what would you say, how would we address that fear? And uh, how can we help to integrate, maybe through culture, uh, arts, uh, these uh, young people that identify as Americans and maybe they're going to face this uh, decision to go back to Mexico? Mm -hmm. Well, that's actually one thing, um, wow, it, it, it breaks my heart really because I have a lot of friends that, that, that have been crossing the border also because of DACA, you know, and, and that have been getting that opportunity. Um, they have visas, and they, mm -hmm, yeah. they, they were able to, to, to come. And um, they have permits to be able to work, you know, like so being able to, to have that opportunity taken away from you and then having the students here that were actually from here, a lot of the friends that I have in Los Angeles too, you know, they were brought here when they were six, five, you know, some of them not knowing anything else, they don't remember anything from Mexico. So it is something that's, that's, that's really hard. And um, I feel, I'm, I'm trying my best also to, to get information for students who, who are currently getting off of DACA, you know, because um, there, there's a lot of resources out there, scholarships that, that actually support um, students who, who want to continue going to school, you know, and um, um, just a couple of days ago, I talked to some people that were actually trying to adopt people, you know, mm -hmm. saying, hey, like, mm -hmm. I want you to have this opportunity, and that touched my heart, you know, because Hearing, hearing these people that's, that are just reaching out, that's unity. You know, that's, that's something that, that they say, I don't know who you are, but I believe in your dream. And that dream, just because it has a title that's getting removed, doesn't mean that it's not a dream. And it doesn't mean that it's not coming true. You know, it's going to happen. And I feel like, like art is one of the main things, like protest, you know, in, in a way of artistic points of views. You, you put up what you feel up there and, and People look at that, you know. So, one of the the art pieces, you know, that that actually in the Tecate border, you know, that yes. that mm -hmm. 
that that was in the news, you know. So people see that. People see that 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 there's unity. That people are rising, you know. And and to see that, that's a great movement, you know. So I feel like like there is a, a lot of fear, but there should be that unity. And with unity, you know, we we can move. We can move and we can go places. Okay. So. And David, mm -hmm. I want to ask you. Mm, we, we, uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, culinary experience, the Mexican cuisine, and how we're uh, improving in that area, mainly in this area. And now with uh, beer and your place, um, how can that be a, an element or a vehicle to unite? Uh, because there is a division in this country. There are people that are uh, supporting uh, the relationship with Mexico and uh, Mexicans and support the dreamers and that kind. But we have to face that uh, there are a lot of uh, people that they don't. And they don't even want to know about Mexico. And they don't uh, care about world culture or anything. But how these, um, because I think that uh, uh, food, and wine uh, bring people together. <laughs> you know, it's very important when you try to build community, how you have uh, uh, this um, una mesa, you know, this uh, table with friends and everything, and you can sit people there from different backgrounds and talk, and then this unite us. But how do you see from, from your side, uh, what can you do to build this community or what do you think about that? No, absolutely. Uh, when we first started brewing, you know, we thought about, we were the 86th brewery in town. There's now over 180, approaching 200 in, in the county. And as I mentioned earlier, what we bring to the table is our culture. I mean, if uh, you can't dispute beer brewing is about culture as much as it is about, you know, drinking and enjoying yeah. uh, beer. It, you know, there's specific regions in Europe where certain traditions came out of, you know, saisons or ales or, or whatnot. And we said, well, look, there's plenty of people exploring IPAs and doing all kinds of things, but we're going to bring our culture to the forefront. And we saw it as a way of contributing and enriching the San Diego beer scene. And in fact, we're one of the few breweries that do that, I think, in the way that we're doing it. So I think just merely being a voice in that community, which is, by the way, one of the largest, you know, craft brewing communities in the world, mm -hmm is, I think, a beginning of that dialogue of, you know, people coming and saying, you took Jamaica flowers and made a, you know, Belgian Saison out of that? Wow. Never would have thought of that. <laughs> and yeah, we did. And it's delicious. <laughs> you know, and so we bring our palate, we bring our tradition, we bring our culture, we bring all those things to our beer making. And I think at the end of the day, I think what we have to realize that what makes the U.S. incredible and unique is that contribution. You know, where all of us from no matter where we came from, we didn't abandon everything about who we are. I mean, we eat pizza, we, we eat hot dogs, we love, I mean, if you just look at our culinary traditions, we're, we're so rich. Just go to a country that doesn't have immigrants and you will suddenly realize how boring that country is, no matter how good their food is. I mean, I, when I was in Guadalajara for three or four years, you know, bringing up manufacturing operations, I just, I couldn't get any great Chinese food. I couldn't get great sushi. I mean, it's gotten better, obviously. It's more cosmopolitan <laughs> now. But this was quite a way back. And, you know, forget about Ethiopia. Forget about all the other rich kind of traditions we have here. And that's the beauty of it. And before we know it, those foods, those traditions begin to define us as Americans. I mean, right now, salsa is more popular than ketchup. Tacos is right up there with pizza and hot dogs and everything else. It's as American as apple pie now. So we think that, you know, bringing that beer, but, you know, we don't just stop at the beer. If you go to our tasting room, you'll see that we've created a space to also communicate visually. So all of our artwork is made by Chicano or border artists, and it really expresses that fusion. And I just get so excited, you know, looking at that, bringing in music and performance that expresses that fusion, you know, reggae in Espanol or, you know, rock in Espanol or something, and they're all just kind of, and we also have, you know, 16 of September is coming up, so of course we're going to do the grito, you know, we're going to have the mariachi and everyone's going to sing the, you know, required 10 songs that you need to know <laughs> if you're going to be a Mexican, right? <laughs> I mean, 
I sigo siendo el rey. I mean, anyone who doesn't know that, you got to turn in your Mexican card. So, <laughs> so that's what we do. That's what we think we're bringing. Uh, we go to food festivals. Um, we just, you know, that's our voice. That's what we express. And I think people react to it. And let me leave with this last comment. Um, it's a really interesting thing that we've discovered. We said to ourselves, we want to interpret the contemporary uh, Mexican experience. We don't want to be a commercial, you know, uh, colonial, uh, you know, copycat of, you know, some commercial restaurants that are out there that really mm. hacienda de this and via de that and all that. <laughs> Good for them. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> but we want to reinterpret what it means to be a contemporary Latino. Someone who's considering all the cultural influences coming at them from music, food, and everything else, and saying, yeah, we, these are the things we love. It, it is possible to be a Chicano or a Mexican and love Morrissey, you know, the band, the Smiths. Yeah, that mm -hmm. goes together. If you want to be a punk rock Latino too, you can be a punk rock Latino. So all those fusions are things that kind of we want to contribute to and enable and, and acknowledge. Because I think those commercial voices become very pervasive. You know, and uh, I guess this is the last thing I'd say is the thing I'd love about it when people come into our place is they look at it, they, and it's really interesting. They look around and they say, I feel like you designed this for me or you made this for me because you're, use, you're speaking my cultural language. You're, you know, we have a beer called uh, Abuelita's uh, Chocolate Stout. So mm -hmm. we use Abuelita's Chocolate. And who didn't have an experience chewing on those things as a little kid? I mean, so... <laughs> So, but how can you explain that Abuelita Chocolate, for example, when, uh, you know, an American? Because that's for Mexicans. But what yeah. we want is Americans to understand us. So uh, if I put Abuelita Chocolate, it's like, OK, Marcela, that's fantastic, but it's for you. <laughs> but that's, that was the beauty. This is, we didn't expect this. So we said, let's be a contemporary Latino experience, and let's make beers that reflect our culture and our experiences. Yeah. And let's be 100% authentic and have that as our focus. And so obviously Latinos find it nostalgic, connect with it, love yeah. it. The thing we didn't expect is people who are not Latino, who didn't share that cultural history, come in and still love it. And the reason is, it's exotic. It's different. And it, they still interpret it in their language. So for example, our blood saison, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, this is you know, the head. This is like a Belgian saison, you know, farmhouse <laughs> ale. It's got this and that. And they'll describe it in their language and their, their terminology. But they love it. I mean, we've won awards for that beer or Chata Golden Stout. Um, it stands on its own. I think flavor crosses borders, right? Of course. <laughs> oh, and remember that chocolate came from uh, Mexico. Exactly. So the Belgians just put added sugar and, you know, but milk. <laughs> chocolate is from Mexico. And, and I wouldn't say exotic. I think that uh, Mexican culture is sophisticated, you know? Uh, maybe uh, it's going to be sound like, oh, no, you're exotic. No, it's sophisticated. And you have to, like uh, music, you know, like Sati, if you want to get acquainted with Sati and understand how his music is, you have to train your ear. So that's what you have to train you to get to, get to know the Mexican <laughs> culture. You have to get sophisticated. That's how I put it. And uh, I'm going to ask you, what's the difference with this concept of bread and salt, for example, with Liberty Station? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, bread, bread and salt has, did not just appear <laughs> fully realized when we bought the building. We, um, we came at bread and salt. It's, it's been six years of moving very slowly and experimenting and meeting people and inviting them in one person at a time. So and it, we're very organic. We're extremely informal. Okay. Uh, we give artists a tremendous degree of freedom and groups that want to meet at Bread and Salt, a tremendous leeway in, in having their events. And we try and stay open and we say yes as much as possible. Liberty Station is somewhat staged, uh, somewhat of a Disneyland. There's, there's those, there, there are those aspects of it. And I, there's a lot of good things at Liberty Station. But um, we are trying to remain as unpretentious and, 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 and open as we can. But I think that's the basic difference between the two. OK. And Jesse, I want to ask you, who's helping you with all this? Because you seem like you're a fighter and you're like a, 
<laughs> Lone Ranger, but who's helping you? Who, who, um, who's supporting you to do all this work that you're doing? Yeah, so actually, um, one of the people that came with me today is uh, Laura. She's from the Jacob Center of Neighborhood Innovation. And um, they're a great supporters, actually. They're, um, they've helped me learn from their classes, their courses, graphic design, which is one of the things I'm going to step into with the organization. And um, apart from that, um, a lot of different organizations like uh, Monarch School um, and um, Arts, A Reason to Survive, they've helped me a lot too. So um, just different mentors and people in my life that have, that have had just believed in my, in my dream, you know, of, of creating a change and, and believed in, in the dream of art, you know, in, in general. Uh, just great people that, that see, you know, what, what the future is and, and they see that the future is youth, you know, so. Great. But let me ask you something. I, I hear very little about what, is, what else you need. So let's figure out, let's imagine that I'm Santa Claus and I'm Santa and you will ask me two things to get what you want, to, to make sure that, to get your dream done. Uh, what would you ask Santa? I mean, Santa could be the federal government, the state government, whatever. But what is what else you need out there to to accomplish what you want to accomplish? Can the consulate ask these two things too? <laughs> that, that's why I didn't Sorry, ask you, Marcela. No, no, <laughs> it's not about budget. <laughs> I, yeah, I would uh, I would start by saying, dear Santa, but in place of Santa, we're um, the Friends of Friendship Park, which I'm a member. We are petitioning uh, the president of both the United States and the president of Mexico on a change.org uh, org petition that we're going to open next week to um, allow us to design and construct a truly binational park on the border, the site of Friendship Park. And, um, oh. and, the, park, and the, park will be, the park will be very large. It will encompass all of what you see at Borderfield State Park, the Mesa, the Mesa part of it, where the parking lot is on the US side, and a, the same size piece in Mexico. <laughs> and it will have a pier that goes out on the border where people from both, so this is many acres of a binational park. And the, the time is, is right now, it may, it may seem more impossible now, but I believe it's actually closer to being possible because there's enough people I, I think like us and others out there that see this as a, a very important need and a, a, a signpost that we can show the rest of the world. So and that's what I would ask Santa's, the, the presidents. Okay. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Should I go? Um, kind of selfishly, but also for the community, I think because we face the same issues. Uh, number one is, boy, navigating the administration and permitting and licenses is incredibly complex. We work with the ABC, you know, the local government, uh, health department and fire department and just, you know, I have an MBA and I'm working with uh, my families, um, but it's so hard to just to navigate the labyrinth. It almost feels like they don't want you to open up businesses, <laughs> but they put up barriers so high that, and I, I say that for me, but think about if we're trying to really bring up entrepreneurs mm -hmm. from yeah. the barrio, from the community, uh, from San Diego, that needs to be addressed somehow, some way. Um, and then the second thing, we are an incredibly capital intensive business. Uh, from a brewing, we, you know, uh, $250,000 is nothing to really get a good operation going. Um, and from a brewing equipment standpoint and all that. So access to capital is very interesting. I was listening to the panel earlier and it was really interesting that what didn't come up is this whole change last year around equity-based internet offerings. Uh, where you can actually do sell stocks in your company on the internet to other people who are either accredited investors or just the public. There's different ways of doing it. And so I've just been coming up the learning curve on that, but that's something that I think has great potential. And we as a brewery want to see how we can use it to fund our growth. Okay. Uh, we have talked to private equity investors, but they come with strings as well. So <coughs> we kind of like the idea of going down this route and seeing what we can do. Okay, well, um, one of the things I really agree on licensing, that's, that's very true. It does seem like, like it's kind of like a little border, you know, saying you really want to try to make this change, but it feels like there's just so many things that are against it, you know. 
And um, another thing would be supplies to be able to spread out that information, like resources and outreach. You know, that's one of the main things. Um, I, I do believe that there are so many people here that want to help, and there's so many people out there that want to help. You know, but being able to connect people to yeah. these to these um, resources, that's that's something that we need to work on. You know, a lot of a lot of the meetings that I've been to, we always talk about, you know, how how do we make a change? How do you know and and some of them would be very nice dining, you know, but once we leave out of those doors, what are we truly doing? You know, what what is a change? You know, how are we connecting people to these resources that we need to connect? So th just resources, you know, being able to, to have that connection. Well, you can use the Consulate of Mexico. We are facilitators and connectors, and if uh, any is there that we can help, then, you know, count on us. Thank you. Sure. I don't know who else. Um, I have a question. It's probably really specific to David. I, there's great things going on where you are. I mean, we used to go, Porky Land was like our go-to, like go get food for a family gathering, and there was nothing. Everything was closed and shut down. But I'm hearing from friends that kind of grew up in that area, that live around that area, there is some pushback, right, of gentrification. How are you hearing that? Are you addressing that in that? And Jim, I don't know if you really get this much. You're a little bit in a different area. But what do you think the answer is to that? Because I, for me, from an outsider, it's like, this is great. It's bringing people to the community. They're seeing what a great community this is. Maybe they'll even go down <laughs> to Chicano Park. Yeah. But I'm hearing people that live in the community that maybe think it's not being handled so great. So I'm curious what's really happening on the ground. Well, I'll tell you what we're trying to do. So we've coined, not we've coined, but there's a term called gentification, mm -hmm. not gentrification. Gentry, mm -hmm. And so we, we ascribe to that philosophy. How do we improve the neighborhood while balancing the needs? And most importantly, keeping the identity, which is not just the buildings and the businesses, but it's also the people that make that community so special. So Barrio Logan, many may not know, is incredibly prolific in the art scene. I mean, James, you've probably seen that as well. There are tons of galleries when I first came there. And that's what really brought me there, is that there's a whole culture and community. And so I think that's where we're trying to go. But the real rub with anything, really, is any improvements to that barrio will have impacts on the rents. And you know, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, if I was a property owner, I wouldn't be very excited about rent control, but that's one solution. Um, there has to be some kind of joint private sector, public sector, community involvement to try to really make an effort to keep the spirit and the soul of the community, even as it improves. And, uh, and so we've been trying to walk that balance. And I'll tell you, we're not the only one. Boyle Heights is really a hot spot right now. Um, you know, up in San Francisco, it's really a phenomenon that's going on across the U.S. and a lot of communities. Um, as a business, we do the best we can. One of the things that we've really tried to focus on is really trying to make community entrepreneurs. I'm a very passionate about the entrepreneurial community and using whatever resources and knowledge we have to help those around us. And if you go down Logan, what I'm really proud of is Logan is actually, there's a lot of community entrepreneurs. Um, you know, there's a, by the way, I'm going to put in a pitch for La Bodega selected one of the best gallery experiences in San Diego, right there. Best taco shop, Salud, right there on the corner. Uh, Por Vida, hopefully will get voted one of the best coffee shops in San Diego. So it's, and they're all people from the community. And that's what I think really gives it soul. Uh, mm -hmm. it, and that's something that's been there from the beginning. And it needs to be something that continues on as the neighborhood evolves. I'd, I'd like to add to that. And uh, as, as David was mentioning, that gentrification or even gentrification, the, the main problem, everyone wants improvements in their communities. You know, you want, a shop, you want a store where you can buy food. You want convenience shopping. You want lights on at night, safe place to walk. But the, there are, there's, and, and I as an architect, I'm interested in strategies to keep housing costs down. And there are strategies. Hopefully it won't come to rent control, but that's, that's like the atomic bomb of strategies that we still might need, but there's a couple others that we can utilize. There's a small lot uh, incentive or a small lot uh, housing program that's already been accepted in the city of San Diego, where on a single family lot, you can divide it into up to five actual fee simple single family homes. So in effect, you're creating properties with less value, smaller properties, 
and the rents will never get too high. They can't by virtue of their size. Another important tool that the city is debating right now is the Granny Flat Initiative that gives all uh, single family owners the right to add a rental unit on their property. And if the legislation is handled properly, they'll get rid of the parking requirement for that, which is what makes it impossible to achieve now. That will flood the market with affordable apartments. And it will happen in all uh, the whole area of San Diego. That's a really, really important legislation that will also have the long-term effect of cutting down on, on homelessness. So these are two ways to fight the rising cost of housing that we really, we really must focus on. There is a lot of uh, activity throughout the country for organizations, you know, supporting Hispanic growth. But what is preventing the major American companies, except for like Bimbo, I mean, um, uh, Pepsi, you know, Kraft, or those, to really invest, like companies from outside are doing it, like Nestle, Bimbo USA, et cetera. Why are the American companies not as aggressive in that? And I'm going to ask you, David, in your case now, the, you have the own the new CEO, you know, HP. He's an Australian with a different type of background. <laughs> Is he going to really embrace this? Because they're pretty multicultural. So what is, what is preventing these American companies? Because they're not growing as fast as the outside companies. Nestle grew from nothing to $15 billion in only six years in the U.S. Hispanic market. Ben & Jerry's, by the way, opened Brazilian operations before they came to, America, to, to the Hispanic market in the United States, which you cannot compare the markets. Yeah. And purchasing power. Yeah, you know, that's a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say that HP has gone through its own journey. It's one of the oldest tech companies in, in the world. And uh, we've obviously restructured into split into two different enterprise and consumer. Uh, and I think we're providing growth, but I think you're talking more about, uh, you know, we're a very global company. La I, I manage Latin America. That's my largest market for my educational products. Um, so incredibly important for us. Um, I think it just really depends on the products and the markets, um, but, but we're very global. I'm not sure if we uh, are attuned to the Latino community in the U.S. That's probably another angle that you're coming at it. Yeah, um, I would say that we have a lot of internship programs you know, we, we, that are tied to universities and, and we work with folks, uh, but I haven't seen any marketing per se that's very specific to that market segment. And I think it's just, it, I think it gets lost. You know, when you're in the billions and billions of whatnot of anything, it just gets lost and you have a much more generic approach to, to the market. Well, the last question. Yes. I'm a border citizen. I love the border and I love to study it. I grew up in Tijuana. I'm living here in San Diego right now. And uh, I love it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that most of the people here in this room today also are consider also consider themselves to, you know, border citizens like myself. Yeah. Uh, and that's pretty cool. But I think that also um, many people both in San Diego and Tijuana don't see what we see in the border. There is this border wall that at some point was created in their minds. And we receive questions like, hey, you crossed the border today? Why? Or here in San Diego, they tell you, you're going to Tijuana, you're going to die. And I'm like, no, you won't. Yeah. So in your opinions, you as border citizens too, um, what can we do, everyone here today, to like demolish these walls that have at some point created uh, were constructed in these people's mind. What can we do to truly make this border culture a like widespread border culture in like this binational region? What do you think? Who wants to answer? Um, I think being able to um, share the culture, you know, spread spread the spread the culture a little more, you know, let let people know what what we really are about, you know, let, let them know that it's not just about, oh, you go across the border, you're gonna die. You know, it's not like that. Like, we're so much more than just that fear. You know, we're so much more, we, we have, like I said, like, well, like every, everybody here, like, you know, we're spreading out. 
the border is just something that that's physically there, but everything else, how, how did it cross? How did our culture cross? How did all that, you know, the food, the art, the music, everything, you know, you hear Despacito on the radio how many times, you know? So it's being, <laughs> it's being able, and it's not only like, like from, it's just different types of, of, of people, you know, coming together and sharing that culture, not necessarily only having to be Mexican, but everywhere else, you know, spreading that, that love, you know, spreading, instead of just saying it's violence and fight, what are we really about? You know, let, let's spread that, that truth, you know, so I think that's the main thing that we have to focus on. If I could just add, I like how you put it, it is a third identity, right? I, I kind of, I realized very early on que ni, no soy de ni de aquí, ni de, ni de allá. Yeah. Uh, when I went to Guadalajara, they made it very, very clear to me that I wasn't Mexican. <laughs> and I've grown up in the U.S. and I've always known I wasn't quite 100% um, from a cultural perspective. But I think that's, so to me, the border citizenship or border identity is a state of mind. And I think the artwork, I think the food, and honestly, I think it's happening already. I think it, it's not at ground zero. I mean, if you look at uh, Tijuana, it's one, it's one of the largest hotspots now for craft brewing Mexico. Mm -hmm. They're racking up awards, they're doing all kinds of stuff, and where did they get that? What a coincidence. We're a hotspot for beer, they're a hotspot for beer. Well, guess what? It's this. This is going on. Every weekend they're coming over here, we're going over there, and now there's this interesting, it's really a level of conversations, I think. You can have a conversations about business, and I think that you know after NAFTA that began to get more formalized. It's always been there, but it started to grow. Maquiladoras, these are all different. So if you had like a conversation meter, like what are people from both sides of the border talking about? I would say that conversation's gotten more and more intense, more diverse, more interesting, and over a, more, a larger variety of topics. Now we talk craft beer across the border. Now we talk about food, Valle de Guadalupe, wines, uh, all kinds of things. So I think, I think it's happening. We can encourage it more, and I think we all do, mm -hmm. uh, but it's happening. <laughs> Bigger. <laughs> James, you want to add something? Yeah, if I, if I, could, if, if, if sure. I could wish that that the citizens of the U.S. one by one visit Friendship Park on a Saturday and Sunday between 10 and 2, the only hours that it's open, and they go between the two walls and, and see the families meeting across that really tight woven fence where all you can touch are fingertips. That's it. You can barely see a person's face, but it's, it's the, probably the aesthetically ugliest park yeah. in <laughs> America or maybe the world. But at the same time, it, it has a, a, a very deep soul, and it's a, one of the most important <laughs> parks also in, in America. People would have a different idea about uh, the, uh, what the border wall, mm -hmm. the destructive quality of our current situation with the border wall. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse, David, James, and to everybody here. And if you want to ask me what we should do, I think that we have to lead by example. And if we are going to say, I'm going to work on this, let's work on that. If I say I'm going to be honest, let's be honest. If I'm going to be direct, let's be direct. I think that we have to have this commitment. Thank you. Thank you all.